So, Tara, I'm going to call you up here one. Yes. 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 I have no idea what we call it. Okay. No, I upload the PowerPoint and the server converts it. No, it doesn't. That's true. But it doesn't go over top. And I don't think it's Okay, we're going to try and get started here as we do uh, trial and error learning of this Chromebook. <laughs> so, um, the note well, please. Uh, by Thursday, you should have read this like so many times. So, uh, I'm not going to go through it, but you yeah, please honor it. So we were just rechartered uh, five days ago, and uh, four new work items were added as part of that recharter. So there's a call for adoption uh, for each of those four. Uh, at this point, about uh, half of the people are speaking for and against one of the documents, and everyone who's spoken on the other three has uh, been supportive. We'll uh, make a call on that uh, shortly. And this is the uh, charter that we had discussed on the mail list. So far as I know, there uh, are no bashes. But if so, if there are, please go to the mic now. OK, then we're going to follow this. Uh, agenda for today. I uh, will point out that in uh, agenda item four uh, of the uh, four documents that we're considering for calling, three of them have my name on them. So for those three items, Tim will be making the consensus calls, not myself. Okay. Now we need to figure out how to get to uh, the CAA slides. And while we're doing that, Jim's going to talk to you about the uh, 5750 and 5751 document. I may have my numbers backwards. Uh, 5750 is past the IESG and is waiting for the area director to verify that I have made all of the edits required by the IESG and then be release it to the RC editor's queue. 5751, last time I looked, still has the discuss on it. Ben has not cleared it. Um, the IESG objected to the fact that I said that a decision that we made was due to politics. Yes. Um, and that the, the, the paragraph in question has been removed and a new version has been published. So as soon as he fin clears that discuss, it will go to the area director to check that I've made all of the edits and then uh, is, will be released to the RC editor's queue.
so the other one, Eric, is there, are you just trying to send them as a pair because they're going to sit in the RFC or Q anyway? Okay. All right. I just. <laughs> All right. Let's see how this presentation thing works. Philip, you want to come up? Yeah. Yeah, I underestimated the time it would take me to get here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is mostly Jacob's work because. Uh, oh, can I have the next slide? This is not. Yeah, this is not. Oh, is it? Okay, so there's a new draft that is now uh, entered as a working group draft. Um, and if you sk skin through to uh, section eight, there is a differences section, which is kind of, you know useful and uh, I'm taking it on faith that there's no other changes in there I've not uh, but uh, so basically we're obsoleting RFC 6844 yeah. modifying the key key climbing algorithm which was the main semantic change that we needed to make and this has to do with basically well the world has changed since we originally wrote CAA and what had been a corner case is now the dominant case and vice versa. So it simplifies the, the processing algorithm. Um, so it's only uh, performing tree climbing on the domains in the chain. It's not going elsewhere. And the only time it's resolving C names is at the uh, resolver for the things that are actually in the chain. Uh, there's a deployments consideration that's been added, which uh, is now based on uh, experience. <laughs> and uh, there's a clarification of the A, B, and F grammar, and uh, clarification, clarifying issues like what happens if you do, you have a CAA record, but there isn't an issue or an issue wild record, and all these corner cases that people have uh, come up with and. Uh, chose to decide that there was ambiguity. I mean, I, I don't think that we've actually changed anything semantically, but we have removed <laughs> the, the ability to claim there was ambiguity. <laughs> okay, so next slide. Uh, there's a few things outstanding on the list. Um, one thing that I, we've not fully closed on, uh, when CAA was first proposed, um, it did actually have a policy tag so it allowed you to say, uh, this domain only has extended validation certs issued for it. That was removed. Uh, and the reason for that is, if you have a record that says you can only issue certificates from Alice CA for this domain, well, anything beyond that can be agreed out of band with Al between the subject and Alice CA. And that's better than trying to put every piece that you might want to put in that conversation into the CAA record, or at least that was our feeling. So that's what uh, we have said on the list, and uh, if anybody's got any uh, disagreement with that, uh, please say so on the list pretty soon, because uh, I'd like to mark that closed. Uh, finally, there was an issue raised the other day with the ABNF again, and uh, a tweak to it. Uh, which looks like it's right, but uh, somebody's got to put it through the ABNF checker. So if you go to the last slide. So there is one other issue outstanding, and this is one of the questions that have come up about what to do to uh, report errors. And this is something that came up in another working group and has started popping up all over the place. And it looks like we need to have some way of reporting stuff that is generic across, you know, if we're going to change the way that it's done in CAA, I would prefer to do it in a way that is replicable by other working groups. And there is a proposal to do that based on some work that uh, Dave Crocker has done on uh, cleaning up the prefixes in DNS. And so we've got to uh, see what's happening with that draft before you write a new text around it. So that's an action item on me to uh, talk to the AD's concern to uh, find out if they're progressing uh, Dave's drafts.
So, questions? Your answer further, there's a lot of noise in ACME about a parameter syntax in 6844, and either you didn't mention it or you alluded to it and I missed it. Uh, the parameter. Um, that's the A, B, and F stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, th there were two issues. One uh, that uh, folk, some folk wanted to put dashes in the tags, and I didn't allow for that originally. Yeah. That, uh, Rich Saul's Acme. Um, so the plan that we were doing, we came up with in the working group, was we're going to submit an errata to six, the original doc that will basically map the white space mapping to what this one is. Um, because we don't want to wait on our extension draft, on our CAA usage, our CAA challenge draft, for this to go through the cycle. So we're just going to submit a RADA. It's going to be AD approved. And then the two will be compliant in the white space area. That's all. OK, so that's basically what we've done with the other tree climbing errata. Yep. Uh, Corey Bonnell, trust Why wave. did that take like 50 messages? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I think this is one of the, the, you know, as soon as you touch the DNS, it takes 50 messages. <laughs> I mean, the thing that got me was that when we did the tree climbing one, I got uh, four errata on the errata from the same person. <laughs> uh, Corey Bonnell, trust with. Um, so the uh, ABNF um, actually... See, so if you look at it, it had an ambiguity based on the white space, but then also in section three, and, in, and it specified that the parameter deliverer is a semicolon. So the document was actually just downright contradictory. And some CAs went off and used uh, semicolons to fill in the parameters, and other ones used white space. So um, beyond that, I, I think the ACME CAA, uh, uh, the proposal there uses semicolons. Um, so when I originally submitted the uh, uh, mostly corrected ABNF grammar to 64 uh, bees uh, earlier this year. Um, I, I switched it to use semicolons there. Um, and then Ilari uh, uh, Lewis Barra, sorry if I butchered the name, uh, found a problem again with the, uh, with the uh, ABNF, alluding the basically multiple white space characters. So uh, put the ABNF tools through their paces and hopefully that's, that'll be the last of the issue. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, the semicolons, I think, is the right way to do it since that's the way that happens in uh, or all, all the RFC 822 type parsers have been using semicolons to pass headers since forever now. So that's the way to do it. And also, that's what uh, DNS service discovery says to do. So I think that's the path. Okay. Thank you. Quinn, you come up. So, um, so um, we've been um, adding the shakes um, to PICX and CMS um, for signatures and uh, hashing and MAC. Um, originally, we decided to use the, um, the hash parameter in the um, RSA PSS signature um, because that was the least amount of work uh, we, we needed to do. Um, but last time the group decided to uh, to use um, new OIDs and hard code or the hash or the parameters so that it would be very simple, uh, no way for implementers to mess up. And that was a good idea. And um, with that direction, we we basically rewrite the, uh, the, the draft um to uh to make it happen so we um so well right now i have two um 
new OIDs for the, um, the RSA PSS, which hard codes the hash, the source, and the MFG function to generate the, the masking value um, in the documents. Um, we also um, updated the public key sections and uh, with the new IDs and more description about the usage of the new OIDs. Um, for the um, pickets draft, we removed the, um, the uh, shake uh, hash function section because it's not needed anymore um, because we hard coded all the hash functions in the, the uh, digital signatures. Um, and we do a lot of um, editorial fixes to make the draft uh, read a lot um, nicer, shorter, and cleaner. So here are the uh, OIDs. Um, the first two ones are the OIDs for the, um, the, um, the RSA PSA with Shake uh, 128 and Shake 256. And with this new OIDs, um, parameters are, are empty, absent, nothing there. The hash function is corresponding to, uh, to the name indicated there. And the hash function used in the MFF, um, MFG function is the same with the hash function which has its uh, messages. Um, so there, there are no parameters are needed at all for the uh, PSS OIDs. Um, for the CMS, um, we have, um, for hashing, we have the, uh, the shake OIDs themselves over there. Um, and again, the, uh, the length, uh, output length for this, uh, functions are, uh, correspondingly, um, 256 and 512, uh, bits. And we have KMAC, which it used, um, instead of HMAC, um, and, um, also it, it carries no parameters at all. It's just one OID, uh, because we hard coded, um, everything in there. The S value is empty in this, uh, in this definition. And the output length is again 256 and 512. So there's no need for any parameters in to, to go along with OIDs. So it's very clean. Um, I think that that would be pretty much it. Um, okay, Quinn, I have a question. Um, yes. I noticed that the uh, document has the NIST uh, arc for the OIDs to be assigned. <coughs> that means they need to be assigned before it goes to the RFC editor. So when do you plan to do that? Uh, the, I'm, I'm going to do it if the uh, the group is okay with what the, the structure of document and everything and accept it the way we define OIDs right now, okay. then I, I do it. I, I will, I will uh, request Nick to do it. So I think the cleanest way to deal with that is to do working group last call. And if it passes last call, you assign them, update it, then send it to the ISG. Um, how about this? I do it um, next time to get OIDs in, and then we call the last call after that. OK. Because I I think it will happen, but I'm not the everything at NIST, so I. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's not good for me to... Uh, I understand you don't want to sign them and then have us change. That's why uh, I yeah, suggested yeah, yeah. the, let's do the working group last call, then you can assign them however long that process takes, then we'll send it to the ISG. That would be perfect too. Okay. Um, does anyone think this document is not ready for working group last call? All right, we'll start it uh, next week. Thank you.
Okay, in London, uh, this internet draft went to uh, Sec Dispatch. Sec Dispatch sent it here, and the charter was done uh, to allow a place for this. So uh, I'll foreshadow the idea. The end, this is to make sure that you have the information you need to respond to the call for adoption. Next slide. So uh, the CFRG has been working on digital uh, signatures that are based on one-way hashes since uh, 2013. One of those documents is draft McGrew hash SIGs 11, which has completed the uh, last call within that re research group. And it's based on the um, Light and McCauley work uh, that is in turn based on the Lamport Diffie, uh, I cannot say his name, Winter Nintz and Merkel. Uh, basically uses Merkel hash trees to uh, create signatures. It has the properties that uh, it has small uh, private keys and public keys, uh, fast signature generation, fast signature verification using a small amount of code where um, the hash function itself is actually the biggest part of that code but it has very large signature values. Um, and the key generation, it can be fairly slow. It depends on the uh, size of the tree that you want to use. Um, the interesting property, uh, in addition to those, is that uh, hash-based signatures will remain secure even if uh, the attacker does get a large-scale quantum computer. Um, so it's like enough bits to, um, it, it, uh, my understanding is 2x the hash size. The, 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 the quantum computer needs to have that number of qubits. Right. Uh, next slide. Uh, Errol, yeah. Eric wants to uh, expand on that. Go well, ahead. I mean, I, I mean, maybe I'm confused. My understanding was Grover's algorithm got you square root more or less, irrespective of the size of it. I mean, for practical size of a quantum computer. So, um, so like it'd be like incredibly huge to get like that. Must have been for that. I mean, that's my totally layman's understanding. I should have turned to Tim for that. He's, he understands this, <laughs> this quantum stuff better than I do. Okay. Um, next slide. So um, I developed this internet draft. It's been being developed um, roughly along the same parallel course as uh, Draft McGrew. And the idea is that um, how to apply those signatures in CMS. Uh, my motivation ties back to RC4108, uh, which is a specification on how to use CMS to protect firmware packages where the uh, small verification code size is attractive in many of these small devices that we're talking about for IoT. Um, and the idea is if we can deploy a quantum resistant signature now, then if we ever need to deploy, deploy the rest of the quantum resistant cipher suites, we'll have a way to uh, provide integrity protected firmware packages to implement those algorithms. That's why I care. Next. So the ask is uh, that this working group uh, adopt the draft. I would like a review and comment. And as I said in the beginning, of course, Tim will be making any consensus calls related to this document. Questions? Cool. Next one. So we have a, a thread going on on the mail list. I guess we could, uh, I guess Tim could hold the home <laughs> to see if there's anyone in the room yeah, uh, thought otherwise. Hands on how many people have actually read it. Okay. I mean, we, we could do a quick hum on uh, people's general feeling uh, on the position of, on, you know, how do you feel about the current draft? 
uh, if people would think that would be helpful. I think a lot of people haven't read it yet. But yeah, I was surprised as well. Um, the, the draft's been around for a while because it went through SEC dispatch, and I think probably a lot of people read it at that point before it got referred over. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I, I, th I think it would be useful to see. Um, so since it's not sort of an approval or a not approval thing, uh, let's go with uh, option A is this is looking this is looking good. Uh, we need to discuss it and make some comments, but uh, we think uh, we should go forward with this. And let's go with option B. Um, there are some uh, more serious things that need to be reworked, and it's it's not just going to be a little bit of uh, a little bit of editing here and there. So just to get a little bit of a consensus on where we are. Uh, so uh, option A. All right, and then option B. Okay, it sounds like everybody likes it. So, all right, thank you. I tried to figure it out. Like it. <laughs> no, he's, he's yeah. just making them up there. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you very much. Why did you show me that? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Okay, so uh, <laughs> the the uh, point of this document is uh, also quantum resistance. Next page. So the idea is to uh, use a pre-shared key um, in case some quantum computer comes to pass. Um, the uh, concern is that if we do get a large-scale quantum computer, that RSA, Diffie-Hellman, and Olympic curve Diffie-Hellman will all become vulnerable, and that any uh, traffic that the adversary has uh, observed and stored, when they do get the quantum computer, they'll be able to uh, defeat those key management algorithms, learn the key, and uh, decrypt them. The, Proposal here is in the near term, we can mix in a uh, pre shared key to a key derivation function, and that means that the attacker will have to also get a hold of that pre shared key in addition to getting a hold of a quantum computer. In the long term, we want to use the algorithms uh, that are quantum resistant, such as the ones from the uh, that win the NIST competition. We don't know which ones those will be, so we're, we can't do anything yet with those. Next uh, slide. So the uh, draft defines two quantum resistant ways to establish keys. Um, in both cases, the PSK um, has to be distributed to the sender and all of the recipients by out of band. It can't use, obviously, RSA, diffie Hellman, or ECDSA to distribute the PSK. Um, or that would just be another message the attacker needed to get. Um, 
And uh, then the two techniques are to basically use uh, key transport as in something like RSA and, and then mix the PSK with it or key agreement, something like the look to curve uh, Diffie-Hellman or uh, traditional Diffie-Hellman and again, mix the uh, PSK with it. Next slide. So uh, this slide provides just an overview of, of what I just said, except that it points out uh, a few more steps and that a key derivation function will be used to uh, do that mixing. Next slide. Uh, again, I'm hoping for review and uh, comment. Next slide. And the ask um, is again, adoption and again, Tim will make the consensus call. Uh, please do review and comment. All right. So I actually thought uh, that being able to see where people think was actually kind of useful. So again, uh, how many people have read this particular document? Oh, wait, we have a couple. There's some comments. There's some comments. Let's do some comments first. OK, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Here's Guilin from Huawei. Hi. So personally, I like this, uh, uh, this draft or this topic. Uh, I have not, no time yet to read the document, but I would like to read it later. Yeah, my question is this one. So you mentioned something like the strong PS king. So what does it mean for strong? Do you have some particular uh, definition, right. especially from <laughs> academic so, paper or something? Yeah, sure. Please. So strong means to, that you um, it's got to be non-predictable. That's really the most important thing, and it's mm. got to be long enough. So um, it needs to be at least as long as the key that will be used to encrypt the, the traffic. Um, so th those are the two uh, mm -hmm. things. And I don't know that I said that in the document, but I certainly can. Mm -hmm. um, and then who you distribute it to, um, you, you certainly don't want to go through a significant distribution ahead of every, say, SMIME message. That would drive you crazy. But um, I could imagine enterprises distributing a key uh, to all of the clients in, in that particular enterprise. So all of their traffic was safe as long as that key uh, didn't leak outside the group. Um, the more sensitive it is, the smaller the group you want to be. So you know you got to measure that. Um, in terms of deciding the PSK, but the mechanism gets to remain the same. The only thing you're sending in the message is an identifier about which PSK you used. Okay? Yeah, thank right. you. Uh, so second one is that uh, you mentioned there is two particular messages have been specified in this document. So I would like to know, so is there any source about uh, where these two messages is derived, imported? Yeah, also, according to some uh, research results, or just a purpose the newly. Um, which tools are you referring to? Two messages. You, you specify two messages uh, to define like how to get the PSK or something. Probably you can show your slides. No, uh, okay. You back up. There's two mechanisms. Yeah. Uh, two find. mechanisms. Yeah, okay. That's, right. <laughs> Sorry, that's good. Yeah, so I saw, so I, there are uh, key transport and key agreement. Key transport is the cryptographer's term for RSA style key management, where I make up a key and encrypt it in your public and send you the uh, encrypted one and you decrypt it with your private. Um, and key agreement is more like Diffie Hellman style, where uh, I send you um, my public, you send me your public, we, I use my private and your public, and you use your private and my public, and we derive the same key. Uh, I see. So both of the two mechanisms are actually still based on traditional public key, right? And then you In take that result and mix it with the PSK. The only mm. thing that's unique here is the mix it with the PSK. Mm. In other words, use the traditional stuff, then armor it by mixing it with the PSK using a key derivation function. Okay, yeah, thank you. All right. Hi, Jonathan Hamill from CSE. Um, 
I have a question whether you're aware of any other um, extensions to CMS that use this other recipient info fields, or yes. is this the first one? No, that... there's, there's others. Oh, there is. Okay. Okay, Sean Leonard. So I understand uh, the premise of why this works, of course, but given that it's also acknowledged that this is a stopgap measure compared to strong quantum resistant functions. I guess I would question whether it's time right now for us to adopt this as number one as a working group item yet because it might be a little premature and then second whether this should be on standard track or a different different you know category such as informational okay. so I would argue it's not premature the whole point is to get something out there that would protect today's traffic while we're figuring out what a quantum resistant algorithm is um, and we don't have that answer yet so this is like the only thing we can do Uh, Valerie Smithoff, Valerie Plus. Uh, I want to talk that there is a similar uh, work in IPC committee group and the draft is currently in last call. And I just want to say uh, it, 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 it uses the same technique, uh, mixing a uh, preserved key, um, but uh, uh, in our draft, um, calls, uh, as long as with Scott Fleur and mm -hmm. group and Panos Kampanakis. Well, uh, this this particular pressure key is called post quantum pressure key, a special term. It's probably uh, a good way to consider uh, the same terminology across uh, the different uh, drafts that use the same technique. So you could probably uh, consider changing it to this name to be more explicit that this pressure key is used to defend against uh, quantum computers. I'll take a look at the, uh, the IPsec ME document and uh, see if the terminology directly transfers. If it does, I'll okay. certainly adopt it. Thank you. I'm just going to mention that this is a charter item, and it's a charter item at a standards track. So, um, of course, we, you know, working group could, could decide that they don't like that, but they just theoretically decided they did like it about 10 minutes ago. So, um, so, so, so like I, uh, five days yeah, ago. Exactly, yeah. So, um, <laughs> So yeah. Um, also, since I'm up here, um, I'm pleased to announce that Ben cleared his disgust. So I will start getting on through the documents. Yahoo! Jim's buying at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, we had a few more comments on that one. Um, so I think we're going to go again with with option A. You think the draft looks more or less the way it needs to. Uh, option B is you uh, have some concerns about uh, whether it should be informational or whether there's other work to do. Uh, so uh, let's go with that right now. So option A. All right. And then option B. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Go to the mic. Mic. <laughs> Every question deserves a mic. Max Pala, Cable Labs. Uh, does the option A include adoption of yes, the that, that's document? That's what the real question was. Adoption, not ready for Okay, it. because <laughs> it was not cut up. Okay, thank you. Just a quick question. Is this in any way affected by the NIST call for quantum resistant cryptography? No. no. Well, no. I mean, except that it'll be obsolete once we have such algorithms. Because cause the, the submission ended last year in December and it's supposed to be ready by 2024. Yeah. So is this. So like if they're on schedule, we have. A a good five years to wait, right? <laughs> Better keeping it. And also, you have to understand, even if they finish at that point, then we, then we have to start standardizing those algorithms in our protocols. Or actually, like in the IPC, we already started. We have, an, we have the, uh, this uh, quantum resistant, as we call it. This is not protected against quantum, it's just resistant to start using uh, this uh, uh, post-quantum uh, post shared key or something like that, PPK. Uh, 
Uh, so, so that's the stopgap. And then we have already started making the protocol. That if we have protocol that will be protected against quantum computers, then we might have you know infrastructure which is ready for it when they publish the documents, publish the actually algorithms that are usable. And in that case, we also actually still want to keep the old stuff there. We actually do both. We do both the traditional and the post quantum calculation because. There's so much, the, the post quantum stuff is so new that we want to make sure that we actually don't make it weak, weaker by just adding that or taking out the old one and adding new stuff that is completely broken would be bad. So I would also observe that uh, when Steve Bellivan and, and I were security ADs, we started this initiative to transition from SHA-1 to SHA-256. <laughs> <laughs> we, we thought, Wow, and I don't, we figured we'd be happy at five years if that we were seeing, you know, SHA-1 gone in five years. I told us accurate. Enough said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think the time frame looks like it's, uh, you know, useful, but the problem that I have is rather, you know, figuring out where all the additional hula hoop that you need to do to have the out-of-band channel for the PS, uh, right? That's, that's, I'm not sure mm -hmm. who could help to make a judgment call whether they're, you know, sufficient good examples where this hula hoop is worth it um, because that would be for me the criteria to say yeah sure let's do it so I'll steal uh, an example from uh, Tanya Lang where um, she said if uh, your grandchild was born uh, this year how long do you want the health records of that child protected All right, let's move on to the next one. Okay. Uh, so this one is uh, also in the new recharter. This is for an informational document. Uh, next uh, slide. So the idea is that um, if you have a root certificate and you add to it an extension that says, I have a hash of the next uh, public key that will replace the one that is in the certificate, then you publish that hash value as part of the certificate. If you ever see a future self-signed certificate that has a public key that hashes to, to that value, it is the replacement for uh, the one that you have in hand. So it's just a, a rollover mechanism. Next slide. Basically, the idea is at the time you set the uh, the initial certificate up, you um, create the first key pair and you include in it the hash of the next uh, public key from the next key pair and you publish this. And then again, when you want to uh, create move to that second key pair, you need to compute the third pair so that you can hash that public and put it in that certificate and so on. Yes. Is that assertion bounded by the lifetime of the first certificate? Huh? Uh, unless you renew, right? You can certainly do cert renewal. No, I'm sorry. I meant the other way. I meant so I've got a certificate. I got a root certificate with a hash in it that yes. extends till today. And right. then tomorrow, I, and then for some reason, I don't get any kind of renewal. And then tomorrow, I get a, that I get a thing that, that has the right pre image. Am I supposed to accept that? I would think so. But um, I can make either argument. But yeah, let's have that policy discussion. I, I, I don't really know either. I mean, uh, I can I can make either argument as well. Cause and like that because I I mean I think there's no known cryptographic attack that would make that a bad thing. The question would be, uh, if this is expired, why didn't you get it out in time? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the idea I would have in my head would be the same reason why we should certificate expiry this way, which is to say that like that, uh, you know that that. that I'm only supposed to treat it as valid for that period of time, right. and and that you know perhaps it perhaps 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 in this whole thing has been revoked. Uh, I know not really revoked, but effectively revoked. But I'm not I'm not getting updates for it. Right. I don't know. I, I, I that's a that's a great point to discuss <laughs> <laughs> on the list. Uh, Jim Shot. Yeah, that's basically I think the same issue I had, which is if the current key pair gets compromised. Mm -hmm. How much of a mess am I going to be in? Um, 
can I really trust this new cache? Uh, yes, and, and here's the, the reasoning, I believe, is releasing the hash of the new public key early does not let the attacker even find the key pair to begin cryptanalysis yet. They, they do need the public key to even start because they'd have to first find the key pair that mapped to the uh, hash value, which is supposed to be too impossible, and then they could begin the cryptanalysis. No, no, no. I was going to grab the R. I was going to. I was going to compromise the R one key pair, mm -hmm. issue a new R one replacement, and go. An issue a new self signed. Sure. Okay. That's the the that ties to what Eric asked. If, if, if I can create another self-signed certificate using that same key pair, but you're going to put a different um, H2 in it, right? And that's the, the whole reason for um, enforcing the uh, not before or not after that, that Eric was talking about. But on, yeah. on Jim's comment, I mean, if it's broken... What is probably, it? The, I, I would be more worried if it's stolen. Sure. But if, if, if it's broken, it's probably the next key is not trustworthy either. But uh, if, if they're stored the same HSM, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So, but uh, on, on, on the first comment, I think that, and that's maybe something that is out of scope, but, but the, the certificate is not trusted to vouch anything about itself. I mean, that's the basic concept. So, all the information about how and for what to trust the root key is, is out of band policy, including, I would suggest, the validity time. So I think that whole thing should be out of scope for the validity time you actually have in a root certificate because it's supposed to be when you when you say you trust it, you also say for what time you trust it. And, and, and that is the decision process that is not taken from the certificate itself. So you're arguing that this is only a mechanism for earlier rollover? Yeah, I, I argue that that should be a non-issue. Okay. Yes, similar to Stefan's point. Uh, back in the days when I was doing revocation, whatever, folk uh, pointed out that uh, you don't do status, status checking for root certificates. And uh, I'm aware of that. that. <laughs> they are special in many ways, yep. and really all that a self-signed certificate is, is a notational convenience. So they're not really part of the same trust thing. So I think that uh, we're on solid ground answering Eric's uh, joke. Okay. Yeah, Rokimi, actually I think quite a lot of those self-signed certificates we trust are still actually signed by MT5 because they're very old. Uh -huh. <laughs> not anymore? I think most of the last time, a couple of years back, when I check out my Mozilla roots, and most okay, of them were okay, okay. But anyway, Let's not have that but, here. but the question <laughs> I have here is, what's the what is really the you know the what you are trying to gain from? Because I mean, the to be able to update the trust anchor, mm -hmm. it's it's as I said, it comes out of band. Are you really thinking about okay, if somebody ever you know gives you some any certificate anywhere somehow how, somehow during the negotiation or TLS or something like that, you happen mm -hmm. to get a TLS certificate that has a hash that matches your, your any of your trust anchors, you are going to be accepted that as a trust anchor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, <laughs> this idea is actually way more than 20 years old, okay? Yeah, but I think it actually would be very scary about and, that. But I, I think that there are systems where this makes sense. Uh, the first one that I'm aware of that used it was uh, the set specification from MasterCard and Visa. Um, they used a different syntax, but the same exact idea. And where there's, in that system, there was one route and only one route. And the idea is if you needed to roll it, this was the mechanism that allowed you to do so. And it automatically would take, if you ever see, or was there some out of band mechanism that tells us, oh, by the way, now I'm going to update my, you know, uh, trust anchor. So here's the new trust anchor. And yes, you can verify that your previous out of band thing had the same hash of that, which actually would mean that it doesn't have to be stored into the CA certificate at, at all, it needs to be stored along with the TA certificate, then okay, this is the hash of the next certificate. They they did not, as far as I recall, but it's been a while since I've looked through those specs. 
Hi, Rich Sauls. Um, yeah, the, the most useful thing I think for this stuff is to be able to automatically update uh, trust stores. Mm -hmm. um, right now, people, you know, they get it from the Mozilla Dev Program or whatever it is. Absolutely. And <laughs> it would be nice if um, CAs could then, you know, they might have, the trust stores might have issues saying, I've trusted you now, and now that there's a provable chain, I'm not sure they want to make that guarantee to trust forever, but uh, yeah. the, the ability to automate it, I, as we learned from Let's Encrypt, automation is, is good. Is helpful, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Max Bala Cable Labs. Um, I think uh, one of the points that, you know, maybe is useful to raise is that, yes, the self-signed certificate in this case is a transfer mechanism for the key, mm -hmm. <clears throat> not much more than that. Mm -hmm. And that having supposedly, um, if you get this key in a trust way, this is a good way to build a chain of trust. Even if the original key is compromised at this point, if you receive the key in a trust manner, then this allows you to trust the next one. Uh, and nobody can That's really right. influence yeah. that process. So this is very useful. I could probably improve the words there, but yes, I agree with that summary. I could be wrong, but I think there might be a better solution. That is to include Write a draft. <laughs> I, I, sorry. I, I will, sorry, sorry. But so what if, what if you instead included a hash of a very, very secure key that can be used to verify the next public key. Two advantages. One is that you could have some ridiculously secure key that takes a long time to process. But uh, once you do it, you only do it once to validate the next key in line. And if something happened and you want to change key size or anything because cryptographic research and everything changes, you can decide when the next key is issued how long, long it's going to be and what, what aspects it should be, or even algorithm changes. So, so I would actually worry about that mechanism being uh, DDoSed, right? Here's the new key. Haha, -ha, it's actually not, you know, when you finish that remote That's process, another right? thing, of yeah. course. Okay. I didn't think this through, <laughs> but <laughs> just, just a thought. I remember when uh, Microsoft did the checking in the wrong order. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. 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 <laughs> I bet you remember that. Hi, Eric Criscola. Um So, uh, um, which is, this isn't to say that this is something one shouldn't do, but my understanding of the way the root programs work, at least Mozilla, is, is this would not, we would not accept this certificate. I agree. Namely, we require, like, so in this, to take the case of a subordinate, right, which um, is inherently verifiable, we require you to notify us when you when you change your, like when you change your own internal subordinates. Yep. So we wouldn't accept the certificate. We insist you tell, give it to us and we give it to the, I, the I, browser. I understand that. So, I'm not saying this is entirely a bad process. I'm just saying I don't think it would work for browsers. Right. Okay, Sean Leonard. So I guess I have a question. Wouldn't it be better or consider the approach of instead of adding a second key that you're going to use in the future, why not have a hash or information in the new root certificate that can be used to identify and constrain essentially the damage that's caused by the compromised or expired prior root certificate? Because you have to receive the new root certicate through a secure out of band mechanism. Now I no, understand that no, you don't. the whole no, point of don't. this is that so you don't have to. That's right. But <laughs> what if the new key is compromised? What if the new key is compromised? You're right. screwed anyway. Right, but that just makes it worse. I guess it's a yeah. No. <laughs> it's a trust anchor. You got no <laughs> revocation mechanism. Right. But then yeah. it could then it could be used to You're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is Daniel Khan Gilmore. So, uh, right. So, this seems like you are expanding the attack surface, as you just said. Yes. Right? Um, I'm also wondering what the, if we're envisioning an automated update process here, um, how do you see that happening? Because it seems to me like, if there is a runaway, uh, if, if if there's a runaway attack, what what do you mean by a runaway attack? Well. If you're willing to accept automated updates here, why can't I push a million of these at you? You, you? you could push a million potential certificates at me, and I would uh, see that the public key didn't match the hash in the existing trust anchor, and discard them. Okay, so what... But, so, 
at, at the expense of one hash. <laughs> so okay, but I'm so I'm trying to figure out how this interacts with things like CT that we're using and um, so so I, I so, don't see CT interacting with the trust with the trust store. So TT does definitely interact with the trust store. The logs currently only accept certificates that are signed by root certs. Yes. And as a user, but don't themselves, but but they don't. If I understand this right, this, but the root certs themselves aren't in. Uh, but the log can't operate without knowing the root certs. I, I, right. I completely agree. Okay. <laughs> so I want. So someone's issued a certificate. And when I, when I talk to the logs, I know what root certs the logs accept. Mm -hmm. So so suddenly I receive a new certificate, and it chains up to a root C I've never seen before, but it matches a thumbprint. Mm -hmm. Then you got to start. Then do I expect the log to have logged it, even though the log may not have logged it? So I don't expect the log to have logged it. So now if I'm requiring CT. Do I accept the new cert or do I not accept the new cert? You don't. You don't accept the new yeah, cert. I, okay, I so 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 these new. Sounds like that's a security consideration. I need that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I I don't see how that fits together. And then on top of that, it seems to me like once there's been one, like, it seems to me like you could end up publishing R four and R five and R six in the event of a compromise. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a and, and you in end the up the event with, of a compromise. Yeah, <laughs> you're in the same okay. place. Okay, I mean, so so if what we're saying here is in the event of a compromise, everything is everything is on fire, then all this is doing is expanding the scenarios in the event of a compromise, which seems like not a great no. But no, it, but no if you find that you were, um, Jim pointed out the flaws in, in earlier, but the point is that if the um, R1 gets com compromised and you stop using it and you start using R2, right? As soon as the certificate is seen with R2, the uh, clients will stop accepting anything that chains to R1. So R1 is automatically disabled by the Correct. publication of anything with R2. That's right. Okay. It's a different sort of foot gun, but I, sorry, okay. I, I hadn't understood that. All right. Other, yeah. Otherwise, you're in this state where you, where the compromise key is 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 uh, being used and the not compromise key is being used and you don't you're not getting anywhere. Anyway, that's yeah. the idea. Uh, yeah, Rich Sauls. Um, so it's a foot gun only if somebody can generate a valid key pair from just a hash mm -hmm. and make it hash yes. to the same value, <laughs> right? So. If we have people who can look at a SHA-2 hash and generate arbitrary content, then we have bigger problems than just this. Oh, yeah. The other thing is I think this is useful. It doesn't address all of the CERT lifecycle key distribution mechanisms. That's right. However, as we're moving towards more things that are on the net and things that want to do secure conversations, being able to automate those automate updates of those things securely and give them a chain of custody from the thing they they got from their manufacturer that seems really 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 worthwhile thank you uh, queen dang um would it be useful instead of signing the public key alone you also oh no uh, hashing the public key alone you hash also the oid of the next um, algorithm you will use to sign the next certificate. For example, if you do, I say now, next time you do ECDSA, for example, then you have the OIDs of ECDSA and the public key together. So in that case, you can, you can, you know, make changes very more flexible. So you're saying this would allow um, algorithm role as well as key role? Yes. Okay. That's, Maybe that's post quantum role. <laughs> I'll think about that. <laughs> oh, I think we're in pretty good shape on time. Uh, Guilin from Huawei again. So I have two questions. Uh, the first one is that from here, I think like the second generation root key and the initial one and the third one, basically they are separate, they are independent. But just one are supposed to replace the other one. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, second one is that I'm concerned a little bit about the security uh, because I'm not very clear of very I'm, I'm not very familiar with the real procedure uh, to issue certificate or something like this one. So one scenario I'm just imagining is this one. So uh, I think when you will use the private key of the root key, or, or just you use the root key <coughs> to issue certificate, uh, we must very be careful uh, if we use this key. Otherwise, if we use some uh, automation system to check the certificate, in some case, maybe some guy or some bad guy mean, they may ask this, uh, the, 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 the CA to issue a certificate, which is actually, he may try to replace uh, the future root key. Like uh, now, maybe we have the root key R3, so one bad guy may just uh, try to generate the root key 4 and ask uh, the CA to issue a certificate for him. It yeah, looks like just for a customer, but later he can claim, or other users may explain this certificate as the future root key. So well, this depends the, whether the, the, there's two the, issues with what the, you the, just the CA suggested. CA will check the, the, the content. There's two issues with what you yeah. suggested. One is finding the key pair that matches any hash mm -hmm. is itself we believe computationally infeasible. And second, um, a certificate that is not self-signed should just be rejected as a potential trust anchor out of hand. Yep. Mm, let me say how to say that. Mm -hmm. So self yeah self side certificates deal means okay. So so what I mean is that uh, so at least uh, the root key server must need, need to guarantee when he would like to issue some certificate he must need to check the corresponding public key is not he uh, uh, it's self public key. This is my point. That in the yeah. case of. Uh going to the second certificate in the in this chain that um, the certificate itself is signed with R2. Yeah, if I can just break in yeah. here a second, I'm, I'm going to cut the line after the current line that we have. So we can discuss it further out on the list, but just the three of you are the last three. Max Palakable Labs. Um, one question for you. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned that if you start seeing the new certificate use, you have to stop trusting the old one. But there are many possible way, many possible reasons why you start seeing a new, the new trust anchor before the other one is expired. When I want to keep, you know, continuity, continuity across, you know, many different devices, doesn't mean that the certificate, is, the key is compromised. I just want to roll out the next one. So. If you're going to just roll out the next one, um, yeah, I was going to say I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it this way. No, but I want to because be... you would want to extend the crypto period. You know, move the. I mean, if you're rolling the next one out to, for all the reasons Eric already explained, we're not going to push the end date out. And maybe that's a discussion. Yeah, I, I, I do see this. <laughs> okay, so given that. Um, would it be a useful thing to say? Um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not clear about why this would be a bad a bad usage of. You know, I I want to pre-announce my next uh, my next key, even mm -hmm. in case it's not uh, mm -hmm. a disastrous event. Mm -hmm. um, however, have you considered maybe having a scope of that? So, for example. Uh, this hash for the next key is this is the key that I will use in case of a disaster, mm -hmm. and this and this other key would be in case of. <laughs> so I'm going to put many of these in there. Now. Yes. Yeah. With different scopes. I'm, I'm reluctant, but I.
convince me on the mail list. <laughs> yeah, as Tadahiko from Seko, uh, it seems like this mechanism uh, provides some integrity or equality of first and second like certificate, issuer of first and second certificate. But, uh, but like, um, then if you, the, uh, the something like organization information are same, like in same for two certificate, uh, you can like revoke first certificate or something. But at the, at the same time, if you, I think you can use this mechanism for um, delegation. For example, if like holder of root trust anchor change or something, the first first trust anchor can like use the hash key to second like certificate. Uh, oh, well, the, the, I was saying was like it, this like functionality of this mechanism can very change like according to the how you put the data into those certificates. I, I'm not uh, sure I'm following. I'm trying okay. really hard, but I'm I'm not getting what concern you. Have. Oh, oh, okay. I, I'm talking better. Yeah. Well, many ways. Please write it down. Yeah. Ah, well, that, this this won't um, facilitate changing those things. I, I can't. You. This is a rolling the key mechanism, not rolling the, the name mechanism. I. We could say something about making sure other fields are the same, but I, I really didn't think about that. Yep. All right, I think that's a fascinating discussion, and I think it, there's lots of good stuff to discuss on the list. One thing that I would suggest personally that uh, I got out of this is I think the best way to think about it is uh, under a normal ro rollover situation, somebody gives you a new key and root certificate, and you have no information to other than you know out-of-band stuff in order to evaluate whether it's the correct one or not. Uh, this is essentially bit commitment, where somebody has said, uh, somebody has said, uh, my next key will have this hash, and I'm going to do, I'm going to store it with security procedures that are above and beyond what I'm using for my uh, current key. And so, if you see it showing up later on, you may use additional mechanisms in order to determine whether you can trust it or not, including asking through some mechanism whether the original was compromised or not, and whether you should just exit stage left. Um, but uh, the fact that it met, the fact that the hash matches gives you some useful information to use in your trust decision. All right, so shall we adopt this as a good starting point for the next, uh, for the rest of the discussion? Uh, I guess that's option A, and then option B is the building is on fire. Uh, so anyone, people who want to start, uh, go ahead. Uh, well, why don't we make that a third option? All right, so option A is uh, we start with this and uh, we go with it. Option B is, uh, now let me, see, let me see if I can state this correctly. Uh, option B is you like this, but you think there's a, there's a better answer that could be written up instead. Is that what you want? Okay. And then option C is you're not interested or we should go do something else. Option B makes, makes no sense. Basically, adopt this or don't. If somebody has a better idea, then we, they bring it a, a better idea, and then we scrap this vote afterwards. That's, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'm con yes, I'm convinced. It's A or B. All right, so A is adopt, B is do not adopt. So uh, who's for option A? Okay, and option B? All right, sounds like A to me, although not clearly, not by a lot. So. Yeah, I guess that's right, to be confirmed on the list. So Yo, are you re remote? If so, come to the mic, please. No, I'm remote.
Iya. Hi, so I'm Javier. I'm remote this time. Uh, uh, this draft, well, not this presentation, but this draft uh, was uh, presented at uh, Sec Dispatch last time, and uh, they told us to go to LAMP, so here we are. Uh, next slide. OK, so what is this draft about? It's uh, called Star Certificate Short-Term Auto-Renewed Certificates. Now, both of these uh, properties do describe star certificates, but neither short-term nor auto-renewed is the point. The point is that there is no revocation information. So um, short-term is what we have to do to make up for lacking the ability to revoke. And automatic reissue is what we do to allow us to overcome the operational challenge of using short-term certificates. Uh, the draft is intended to list the operational and security considerations for deploying an environment with star certificates. And the intent is for this to become an BCP. It's not standard track. It could be informational uh, or better yet, BCP. So uh, next slide. Okay, I'm going to run through two examples. Uh, I'm going to run pretty quickly through them because neither IPsec nor storage is uh, the point of this. Um, of this discussion. So the first example is uh, an IPsec VPN. So you got your medium-sized company, they have a head office, and it has its data center, and they've got two gateways for high availability in case one of them breaks down. Uh, there's also a backup facility that has its own two VPN gateways. You've got your R&D centers all over the world, and they've got uh, several networks be inside them, and uh, again, VPN gateway. Then there are the regional sales offices in the smaller country, or uh, in the case of the United States, usually a state uh, sales office. Each one of them has between five and 30 people, and of course, yet another VPN gateway. Then you got a bunch of people who work from home. And for some reason, a lot of companies prefer not to give them software um, VPN clients, but rather give them uh, small uh, CPEs. And, uh, some good operational reasons for that. And then there are the people who travel around and then have they have to use uh, some sort of software VPN client. Maybe they're, it's installed on their phones or in company provided laptops or in their own laptops. Either way, we're getting hundreds, maybe thousands of clients, of gateways and clients, and all of them have to be authenticated. So next slide. Um, so there challenges we face when deploying such a company-wide VPN is, well, we would like to stop intruders from connecting to our VPN and seeing our data. Uh, we want to prevent rogue gateways and or clients from impersonating one another and getting the wrong kind of data. And um, we don't want, and we want to allow IPsec traffic from any gateway only if the source addresses from of the traffic belong to the network it is protecting. Well, sort of an anti-spoofing thing. Now, all of these are good features, and we can implement all of them, but um, all of them require authentication. So let's run to the second example. Of the next slide. Uh, yeah, that's old job and new job. So uh, software-defined storage, it's pretty much the same thing that used to be called the uh, storage area networks. And so you've got your data servers. They're servers that have a lot of disk space, uh, 5 to 100 terabytes each. And this data is either mirrored or it's partial, or it uses some kind of parity scheme. And there's anywhere from 1 to 100 uh, data clients. These are application servers, web servers, whatever, that use the data. And they have some kind of driver installed. And these may be co-located with the data servers or not. That's the difference between uh, converged uh, software-defined storage and non-converged. Um, the, and we define virtual volumes, and are, they are mounted on the data clients. And uh, they're using some kind of protocol to read and write uh, data from the data servers. And then we have this controller. The controller, of course, it's replicated like everything else. Uh, it's really running the whole thing. So if I say I need a new volume, a new 5 terabyte volume, it allocates the space, say, uh, 1 megabyte on uh, data server number 1, second megabyte on data server number two, and of course, different data servers hold the uh, um, RAID copies. And 
mounting a volume on a data client means sending it a mapping, telling them where all, where all the different megabytes of uh, a particular volume are. And so the controller manages everything, balancing, recovery, whatever. So next slide. Um, the kind of security challenges you have with such a setup is uh, there are lots of things that you want to prevent. You don't want uh, hosts that are not data clients to um, access your data servers and uh, either read your data or overwrite it. And you don't want uh, real data clients to access volumes that you didn't want them to, didn't uh, mount on them. And you don't want uh, data clients that have read-only access to write on the data. And you don't want an attacker to be able to impersonate the controller and then move everything uh, wherever it wants to. Um, or data servers, which allows them to either read, modify, or fake the data. So these are all good features. These are all features that we can implement. Uh, but all of these require that we authenticate everyone that participates in such a storage-defined storage, storage uh, software-defined storage um, setup. So uh, enough for example. Next slide. Um, so this authentication that I mentioned. You can do the authentication using pairwise shared secrets. Anytime you, tr you start designing something like that with hundreds of nodes, you end up saying, now I'm going to use certificates instead because PKI works. So where can I get certificates? Well, I can think of three sources for certificates. One is the global web PKI, your Komodo, your um, DigiCert. And they're, they're nice, they work and they're very professional, but they're very much geared for the web and a bit for email. They're mostly for the web. That's why they're called the web PKI. So the other source you can get is some kind of corporate CA. This could be a um, Microsoft Active Directory or several other things that are either bundled with an, uh, with, uh, an LDAP. Um, you can even use your own um, XCA or whatever. Uh, but uh, we find as vendors that uh, uh, this meets a lot of resistance because the people running the LDAP server and the internal and the corporate CA are not the same people who are writing, running the storage or the same people who are running the um, networking and the VPN. And the, you need, sometimes need uh, weird names for your servers or for your uh, VPN gateways, and they don't fit with the naming scheme in whatever company, it's really difficult to use the corporate CA. You get this with a few uh, customers, but most of them don't really want that. So the third option is to roll your own. And rolling your own really is a lot of times just Python scripts running uh, open SSL commands. But, but it works. And uh, then you can use whatever stupid naming conventions you want for your product. So it's very easy for a vendor to um, um, include their own uh, in their own CA with the product. So next slide. So the problem with rolling your own is that you really don't want to deal with revocation. Revocation is complex. Revocation is hard, it, and it adds a bunch of failure modes, and you have to deal with those failure modes um, with your uh, Python scripts running OpenSSL. And revocation also takes time. So from the time that I figured out that um, uh, my key is compromised or my server is compromised or I'm throwing away the server until um, the um, relying parties know about it and are going to reject the certificate. This takes a long time. This is at least hours and usually measured in days. Why? Because of uh, the process that it takes and because of caching. This is really hard. And the other thing is that revocation slows down connection establishment because you have to go and check. And it's really hard these days to explain why issuing blob one and then issuing blob two to say that uh, to the relying party that blob one is still valid, that doesn't really make sense, especially when issuing blob one and blob two requires the same effort. In the old days, yeah, issuing a certificate was hard and was manual process, whereas uh, issuing CRLs or OCSP responses was automatic. Now they're both automatic. So why do we need both? Uh, next slide. Okay, so what alternative are we proposing? And the alternative is 
not to issue new certificates and to stop the renewal. So um, to get equivalent security properties, we, want, we propose to make the lifetime of a certificate short. How short? Short enough that we get the same kind of uh, time between uh, stopping issuing until the certificate just expires, as we had with the uh, issuing revocation. So short could be days, could be hours. It all depends on how accurate the uh, system clock is. Yeah, use NTP people. Uh, so to deal with the administrative nightmare of issuing hundreds of certificates every day, uh, we really have to do it automatically. There's no way this can be done uh, manually, especially when there's hundreds of uh, data server or hundreds of um, VPN gateways that all look the same. So uh, next slide. Uh, so this draft, admittedly, this draft requires work. Uh, these are some the use cases have to be ex uh, expanded and pretty much uh, through there every kind of um, issue, whether security or uh, operational that I could think of. But there probably are others, there are probably pitfalls besides the obvious uh, time thing. This requires a lot of work and um, we hope that this work can be done in this working group. So uh, the next slide just has uh, some anticipated question, but uh, feel free to run up to the mic and come up with your own. So next slide. So these are the questions that I anticipate. And uh, so is this for the web? And my initial instinct is to say no. I mean, I don't know. Maybe this is good for the web. But um, for the web, we already have Acme uh, writing documents, especially for the web. There's the CA browser form. In making rules for uh, uh, issuing certificates for the web, there are lots of places to do that. And uh, this draft in LAMPS is not the place for that. If what we come up with is good for the web, so much the better. But uh, this is not the use case that is driving uh, this draft. So the other question is, um, uh, there was a proposal that we need some extension to say uh, the, this is a star certificate. We have no revocation information, rather than just not including the extensions that say this is a CRL, this is an OCSP response. I don't think so, but if the group wants it, uh, it's fine. But I want this draft to this document to remain a BCP or informational and not a standard tracking. So if you want some uh, new extension that says with an OID that says no re revocation for this certificate, uh, let's do it in a really small, different uh, draft. And the third thing is, well, do we really need to skip revocation now that we have TLS 1.3 and uh, we can, we can use OCSP stapling on both the client and the server side. And I think that we still need uh, no revocation certificates. And the reason is that it does solve the uh, issue that we used to have that, um, well, assuming TLS 1.3 uh, clears off 48. Um, it does solve the issue that uh, we can't uh, do mutual authentication uh, with OCSP stapling. But it does not solve the complexity. It does not solve the requirement to have an always-on revocation server. It reduces uh, some of the failure modes, but it does not eliminate them entirely. So I think there's still uh, great value in uh, doing a simplified PKI that does not include uh, uh, checking revocation. OK, so that's the last slide. And yeah. OK, Stefan. Yeah. One of my questions were up there, the, the other not. So uh, I tried before, and I will try again. And if I fail now, I will forever sit down and shut my mouth. But uh, from the beginning, I think. Forever? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I really, really, really think it's a really bad idea to call this short-term certificates. I, I really like non revocation certificates. I think it's very, very important to have non revocation certificates. I would like to get rid of short-term because short-term is only one usage example. And I really want to use this for solutions or situations where the certificate is not necessarily long, short-lived. And the use case I have that is important is when we use a key, we, gen we generate the key and we use it once. And we are very sure that we're using it for the right thing and we issue the certificate. The certificate is, is, is 
valid for a long time, but we throw away and destroy the key immediately after using it. We have signature systems working this way, and we need the same solution there. There is no reason to have revocation for that certificate, because I have so much control over the use of that private key in that one instance before it's destroyed. So, two different situations that needs the same solution. I'm going to have a hell of a lot of problems selling this if it's called short term, because people believe acronyms and, and names and say, no, we can, you're not use that because that's short term. Well, it's exactly the same usage. Um, and also, I do think that we need an extension or to use an extension. And ideally, I think that we need to deal with situations where old installations, they just require a CRL. So there could be a link in the certificate saying, here is an M2 CRL for those who cannot understand this. And all the new installations or new software that can deal with this could read the extension and say, by the way, don't bother check the CRL because it's empty anyway. There is no revocation of the certificate. And that way, both the old software and new installations and software would use, could use the same certificate and work from day one. Right. So I tend to agree about the naming, um, except that there are other documents that describe such certificates um, going around the ITF, and they are using the name STAR. There's one in ACME. There's another potential one that may come to ACME. Uh, so I'm fine if the um, group wants to bike shed and come up with another name. But um, uh, for now, I use the uh, name that is used throughout the ITF. As for the extension, OK, I get the, um, OK, I, I understand that. Um, again, people want that. That's OK. And, uh, regarding the second use case, um, uh, I think it's questionable whether we uh, can or whether we would like to uh, have a single document covering uh, such very different use cases. Uh, again, this is something for the working group to decide, but um, yeah, I can, I can see it going both ways. I, I just think that the document should not prefer any use cases, just offer a solution and that's a policy out to, out of sight of the document that decides whether the document is to be used or not. Well, but what the document says is uh, that a good thing to do is to uh, issue a new certificate every four days, and that doesn't really fit your uh, use case. Yes, exactly. And all of that kind of wording I would like to remove from this document and not do policy in this document. But you want to you, you do it clearly, but I mean, that's just my opinion. So, uh, so what? So what content would the document have if we remove that part? <laughs> it's, it's just it's fine to not have a revocation, and that's it. Well, I think that you want to have a policy document saying when it's good to have a document without revocation. I think I would like to have a technical solution that can be used for different situations and policies. And I think maybe that's a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, Tolles Eckert, uh, co-author on the document, and so coming from the automation of the enrollment system that we have in Anima that, that we described in there, the, um, the key aspect for me is, is simply the, the ability to express as a permitted you know, policy within the, the PKI definition that we have that um, you know, a registration authority can basically leverage expired certificates purely for the purpose of renewing them, right? Because that in the whole automated system is the biggest risk that happens that creates discontinuity, right? That basically you're working with short-lived certificates and then basically you don't have the ongoing connectivity required to continuously renew them. And in that case, you may want to uh, renew later. Um, and the best interpretation of all the, you know, Anima co-authors on, on that enrollment scheme is that uh, the PKI uh, documents that we have does not currently explicitly permit that. It's not clear if it explicitly denies it, but so far I think uh, the systems I've seen would not permit it. And so simply for the purpose of, uh, you know, renewing the keys or rekeying, whatever, you know, the renewal operation is, also permit the expired uh, certificates, right? Because when we go back and you can check out all the complexity that we did for initial enrollment, all the trust stuff, that's a much more complex operation, which is why, you know, I'd love to have that uh, better leniency explicitly defined as part of, you know, the PKI procedures. 
Hi, Ove. Um, just to Torless, I think the, the I'm Sean Turner. Um, the CP that defines how you use your CA can allow you to use expired certificates. You can explicitly put that in there. Some do, some don't. Um, I know that there are some that do support allowing you to re renew. Right. So I wasn't talking about software. I was talking about the you know what we think the current uh, you know Bibles in the R uh, RFCs say. If, if if they say it's permitted, I'm fine. Then I would basically just inherit it. So our, I think it's RFC 3647 is the CP and how to write that. So you can write whatever you want in there and say, you know, use an expired shirt. You can use it for one day expiry, none, whatever. It gets a little, it gets a little ish, interesting then because then you have to put a, C, have to put a CP oid in your cert and there's like, there's legs there. Just let me know. Um, Yov, uh, I liked your presentation a lot more than I liked the draft. So I agree that it needs, <laughs> I like that it needs work. I was like, oh, that's totally, yeah, it kind of makes sense, I guess. But in reading the draft, I think that there were some things that were factually incorrect, and I think it would be way too early to adopt this draft at this point. For example, it says things like, the certificate discussed in this document have neither a CRLDP extension nor no CSP authority info, authority info access extension. In other words, such a, such a certificate cannot be revoked. That means all version one certificates can't be issued, and any version three certificate without those can't be revoked. And that's just factually incorrect. Um, I thought that the rationale in section two was really funny. Um, STAR has several advantages over OCSP stapling. It's like, you know, the CA is issuing things so quickly, it can just not even keep track of the issued certs. Have you ever talked to an auditor? Like, hey, I used this cert for what? Well, I didn't keep track of that. Good luck. Um, and there's a, cu a couple of other things, like I don't have to run an, OCS an OCSP web server or whatever. I mean, yes, it is more complex. But it's not that hard. I mean, it's like putting up a web server, right? I mean, these these are literally boxes that you start up and hit the button and off you run. Um, I don't know. I, and I think really what the rationale is, you don't want to waste the time to go get the, the, the CRL information. I think we should, could just be upfront about that. And that's really what it is and not try to back your way into the rationale. But like I said, I, I like the idea of short-lived certs or um, I guess revocation-free was the, the term I tried to use last time to put a nice positive spin on it. Um, but I think this draft is so maybe a little early to be adopted. Thanks. Uh, Sean Leonard, I wanted to respond to one point here about um, the extension for no revocation information. So it turns out there already is a extension defined for this. It's called no rev avail, and it's in X509. Now, X509 only defines it for attribute certificates, not for public key certificates, probably for all the reasons that have been alluded to you know, in this discussion. But I did want to point out that it is there. And similar to you know, what Sean Turner mentioned, if the objective is really revocation free, then that should be explicitly stated inside the certificate with that extension or a similar extension. Then the behavior um. That extension is also in 3281. Right. So yes, the purpose is to have revocation free. I and mean, I don't think anybody is really, um, uh, really wants to churn out new certificates every two days if they could help it. But, uh, that's the price we're willing to pay for being revocation free. So Max Palak, Cable Labs. Um, I voice my concerns about this. Uh, proposal many times on the on the list. Um, I don't think that you guys have, have done any attempt to actually um, address those concerns. And this really scares me uh, because I think that you are underestimating uh, the importance of these concerns. One of the things that I want to point out is that there's no way that you can demonstrate that short-lived certificate without revocation as equivalent security level of uh, a system with revocation. Um, revocation happens for many reasons, not just for key compromise. Uh, let's say your employees leave the company and uh, you want to block the access right away, not waiting seven days because your short-lived certificate cannot be revoked. Um, so there's many reasons why I think uh, this should be really, <clears throat> the scope should be clear, more clear. Uh, you say the scope is about this type of problems, but then you say it can be applied maybe in the web if it's good enough. Um, I would say if you want to publish a BCP, uh, you have to 
to clear the scope, this is not for web, this is for this type of uh, use cases, contrary to, <laughs> to what uh, um, you said before. But, um, and I voice also um, what Sean Turner said, there are many other implications. So I would really like, uh, I don't think it's ready to be adopted. I, I have not seen any updates on this for many uh, months. Um, so I think that until we see an update and improvement, it should not be adopted as a uh, as in its current state. Uh, maybe for the next iteration. Uh, Turkey, I have a response to that. Uh, if, if you're if you, if some some of the employers leave the company, you want to clear them out immediately. Yes, that means you want to clear all their existing connections immediately. Revoking his certificates won't do that. In most of the cases, even if you revoke it, for example, let's say IPsec, which I know, you have an IPsec connection to there. Even if you revoke his certificate, nothing happens in IPsec connection. Your SSH connection that you have, you revoke the certificate that was you created that, nothing happens to that SSH connection. You need to go and remove his credentials into the system. You go into the SSH, you go and remove his password and kick him out from the system. Even actually you remove his you know, ETC password entry, that doesn't kick him out of the system. You just need to go and kill his SSH connection. Revoking credentials don't break the existing connections usually. So that's why I think, yes, even if you revoke the, revoke the certificate and of course, you know, CR also usually one hour or two hours and so on, he can still do, you know, huge lot of damage to, you know, revoke, removing everything in the last two hours. You want to make sure that this gets, you know, kicked out immediately, and you don't use revocation for that. Hello, Flohan Baker. Yeah, um, this, if you're gonna rename them, I'd call them implicit status certificates, or try and work that so you don't need to change your acronym. Uh, <laughs> twist star into saying that. Uh, this does come up quite regularly in web world, and the reason that you, turns up on the web PKI is that once you've got to OCSP stapling, well, your OCSP staple is de facto the same as a certificate for the party that's stapling it. And so when you do all the math and so on, why have two things when you could have one? So it, it does keep coming up. And the main reason that uh, the web hasn't gone that way is that there's folk who don't believe that certificate that uh, PKI requires revocation. They're wrong. So one, uh, just a reply to that. You're totally true. You need to have good security control in your company. However, uh, revoking prevents the um, the user to actually get in using these credentials. Um, so. I'm not saying this was just an example. There are many other that one can come up with. Um, I just think that making statements like the same security level is probably misleading. Um, you cannot have the same security guarantees. I made examples that have not been uh, replied to in the main list. So if you have other, the way uh, you can reply to that and demonstrate that those are the same level. Uh, if you do that, I'm happy to uh, to abide by that, but until I see any good argument uh, around that, um, I don't think, and as I said, I think that the draft needs to be uh, taken a look at a little more seriously. Anyone else? Okay. So, Yov has asked us to adopt this. Several have said it's not ready yet. I'd like to see if those are the outliers or not. So, uh, simple home for adopt now or wait for improvements. If you'd like to adopt now, please hum. If you'd like to wait for improvements, please hum. I would say the uh, second was significantly louder. So, Yov, uh, we're not quite ready yet. Okay. Okay. Alexi, you're up. 
<laughs> you gave up all hope when my life, my client was up. So, so uh, yes, in this presentation, I was trying to insert pretty pictures of how broken existing mail clients are for this, but it didn't work during conversion. So you just have to trust me. I can I, I can tell you, you can try it, uh, try yourself. Right, so here we go again. I would like to protect message headers. No, uh, I should say still. Still, <laughs> again, still, yes. Yeah. Yes, so um, the, uh, yes, pretty much. Um, the intent of this presentation is, I don't want to discuss specific solution, it's more of a call for action and hopefully we can have an idea which way we want to do this. So as far as I know, most uh, SMIM implementations don't protect encrypt or sign message headers. Um, sometimes it's desirable to protect at least subject, date, uh, sometimes maybe from and to and other header fields. So RFC 5751 and its replacement say specific text to wrap in a message within content type message RFC to two and include the headers you want to protect within it. So sort of uh, copy the headers you want uh, into the inner message. Next slide. So yeah, sorry, this didn't sort of uh, fit on, on a single slide. So this is the outer header and the subject can be fake, fake subject or you know, some dummy subject. Um, so the outer headers. <laughs> I, I'll teach you later, Russ. <laughs> Um, and uh, then, so this is a multi-part sign as an example, and the first part will be on the second slide, contains the inner message. Next slide, please. <laughs> okay, okay, well. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. Um, so this is the inner message, so there is a wrapper, content type message RFC to two. And then uh, you include the inner headers together, you know, with the rest of the message. So in theory, according to RFC, that sh should be header protection. In practice, you can guess. Okay. Well, yeah, uh, there is one problem is, you know, if you really want uh, um, to include arbitrary nested messages at top level, you can construct some messages in MIME and it's undistinguishable in this case. Um, but in, the main problem is that, yeah, I don't, I don't know any other implementation than mine that actually does this. So I was trying to generate this message and I was trying to see how they show up in various current clients like Thunderbird and iOS and... So I don't know that they do it this way, but there is, I'm Sean Turner. Um, so we've done this like three times, right? And it never seems to stick. Because I know that there was an ISC document that did like securing header fields. Hold on, moment. hold on, hold oh, on. It's nice. mentioned there. It's there. It's there. Don't, don't. <laughs> just, just let me finish. Okay. Next slide. So yes, basically they show it as forwarded messages, and uh, in many cases it displays as at least extra set of headers which is confusing to users and in worst case you see an icon on which you need to click to actually see the inner stuff. This is really ugly. I'm sorry the existing clients do that but that's just the way it is. Right, three proposals so far. Um, there is a memory hole proposal used by PGP people and it, Yes. Memory hole is currently implemented in Enigmail uh, and in K9 mail, um, both of which do use OpenPGP. That's correct. Right. Uh, then there is RFC 7508, which is independent stream experimental RFC, which says includes copy of header fields into special attributes that included in a signed or encrypted CMS. 
So again, they're sort of invisible to the uh, readers that are compliant with this mime but don't recognize them. And the third approach will do nothing and really try to beat existing implementations, try to actually do the, what RFC says. Um, a bit more details on this. Next slide, please. So this is my understanding of what memory hole does. Instead of wrapping everything in content type, message RFC 822, just copy headers with the rest, with the content types like text plane or whatever, which is required to be there anyway. That's what the really, really old Microsoft Mail program does. You know. <laughs> so uh, this is DKG. I can speak to more detail on memory hole. Folks are interested. This is the this is the core of what it does. There is an additional thing that it does to try, uh, to, try to handle um, those clients that are capable of decryption but not capable of reading protected headers as well um, right. to actually display things like subject there. But yeah. this is the this is the core of it. That's right. Yes. Um, the advantages of this is that, again, most clients will just, the clients that don't support it just ignore the extra header fields because they need to have header parser and accept arbitrary headers they don't recognize anyway. So, and when you display it, it will not show it as a forwarded message. It will just show you as a regular sign encrypted message. Next slide. Sorry, yes, as I basically said, the, the pros are, you know, it, it's sort of backward compatible, but we need to change the RFC. Next slide. I, I can give you one additional con to this yeah. in, in the way that you framed it here, which is that if you, um, is that existing clients, if you don't do anything beyond the core here, will not be able to show you the protected subject line if the outer subject line has been stripped. So, does, it, does that make sense? Right, or oh, if it's different, it's not going to, it is going to show you outer. If the outer subject line is encrypted message, yep. and the protected subject line is um, dinner plans, yeah. it will you show you encrypted thing, message. It will say encrypted message. With, a, right. with, a, with an old client, it will just say encrypted message. Right. So, so the memory hole approach is when you, is that there is an advisor, there's, there's basically a, an additional part added to the inside uh, of the encrypted message, which is text RFC 22 headers, mm -hmm. which contains those headers that are expected to be displayed by, the, by older male user agents. So that it, you can see it like sort of in the body. Right. Um, and user agents that understand memory hole, the memory hole approach are expected to suppress that part. So you, yeah, okay. Just that's just to clarify that that's beyond the like that, that part is considered advisory. You don't have to do that. Right. If you're talking to somebody else who already does memory hole, you don't need to include it. Uh, but that's that's the that's the full piece of it. Okay. To avoid okay. this additional con. Thank you. Um, what is displayed in your um, inbox? Just encrypted message, or does it pull the protected one? Uh, we're getting into. Um, mail user agent user interface flows, which is kind of awesome. I've always dreamed that the IETF might be willing to branch out, branch out into this. Um, depending on the mail user agent, if it is caching the uh, clear text, it will show you the clear text of the subject line. Thank you. So again, I mean, the 7508, again, you need to change clients and you need to do, uh, it's sort of backward compatible. You need to change clients to support it. But again, you need to change RFC and do nothing. You know, it's sort of the reverse. The RFC stays the same, but we still haven't solved the problem. So we really need, you know, it, it requires more a sort of marketing outreach and talking to people to fix stuff. Can we please fix this? <laughs> I have, I have my, I have my preferences, but it doesn't matter at this point. You know what my personal preferences are. I just want this fixed. 
this is DKG. We clearly need to fix this. We're 30 years in and it is absolutely ridiculous. I would use stronger language if I wasn't speaking at the mic. Um, so uh, the mail user agent that I'm working on, uh, the, the patch series that I'm working on addresses both uh, Alexei's proposal uh, and, the, and the memory hole approach when it's interpreting messages. I don't know what to emit. I'm happy to emit either one. Right. Uh, but I, I don't particularly like the, um, the CMS encoded headers because that doesn't work for OpenPGP. Uh, the forwarded equals no suggestion that, non, that, right. that Alexi made and the memory hole suggestion both work for arbitrary MIME structure nesting, which works for RFC 3156 as well as the SMIME stuff. So I just want one way to emit. I'm happy to make my mail user agent process multiple ways of protection um, on return, but really to make this work and to make it work for the humans who actually use email, we do at some point need to start talking about what the user experience is supposed to be. Russ's question is right. What shows in the user agent and how do we manage that? That's beyond the scope of this, um, but, but we need this mechanism in order to be able to address that more fundamental question. Right. The memory hole approach may actually get you a bit farther than what you think today. Um, the reason how come the old Microsoft Mail program did this was actually a, a bug in it. So in point of fact, it serialized the headers and before it encrypted it and then it serialized the headers in again. And when it decrypted it and unserialized the headers, it, had, it serialized them back at the, to the top level. Some point of fact, the encrypted versions overwrote the unencrypted versions. There may be other mail programs out That's there besides awesome bug. that. I that like have it. That problem. Can we all implement this bug, please? <laughs> so, so, so that that I would guess that that mail user agent doesn't deal with deeply nested multi-part structures. Oh, well, no, there was an error he was talking about before. Bug. Well, the. No, no, no. So my my so my suspicion so as I've been implementing this stuff and trying to make sure that this works sorry this is DKG again um, the fact that we have gone ahead and have these like arbitrarily complicated mind structures is a serious pain point um, is a pain point for implementers and it's a pain point for users who cannot understand where the crypto in their message applies. So, I mean, we saw this with e-fail, right? I, I, I'm sort of surprised yeah. there hasn't been a presentation on e-fail at this session because we, we, you know, we should acknowledge this is a failure of this community for, for a long time. Um, so, so we have to be very careful when we're specifying this that, yes, when you're decrypting and then extracting headers from the message, there's only one particular point that is where the protected headers could be. Um, because if you pull out those headers from two stages down into the MIME structure, then you end up writing arbitrary stuff over the outside message when you do the decryption. And we, might, we need to be very clear about what that one point is. Hi, Sean Turner. Uh, what DKG said when he got the first time, I agree with the second part too, but still. Um, now that we've got SMIME version four out there, and we, the idea was we started this working group because people were actually gonna go out and implement it. Can we not just contact the same set of people that wanted to do the authenticated envelope data and be like, can you do this too? I mean, if you're gonna drop code to put in a new content type to do SMIME, this doesn't seem like there's that much of a leap to get to do a little bit more. And if you're fixing eFail stuff, like let's do that too. So it seems like, you know, now maybe is the right time to try to reinvestigate this. And I don't care how you solve it, just do it. <laughs> I'm, I'd like to uh, ask a follow-up question, Sean. Um, Wait there, a minute. Oh. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm not sure whether you were advocating pulling those documents back uh, and adding this. I don't think I don't think you need to pull the documents back to fix this. I think you can do it with an update document. It's the same. Like, if we can do this and do this quickly, because there's only so many ways to do it, and hopefully we could actually decide <laughs> fairly quickly. That, that's true. There, I suspect we actually already have text in various forms we, to fix it eight, eight, you know, any one of those three we, ways. We literally so got three ways and we could do a trade off and yeah. like, okay, what are we gonna do? And then like give everyone swords and see what happens. Okay, blood. Um, 
but you answered my question. Okay. Thanks. Um, this is just, uh, um, yes, arbitrary structures of MIME is going to be fun. And I don't know that we can always say that you have to take it from the, you can't take it from the second level down because you end up with things like mail agents, which push everything down a level and may actually, you may actually at that point end up with two multi-part encrypted pieces if things are really interesting. There are also things like triple wrap, yeah. yes. which I have, <laughs> you know, again. So, so um, I've written and published independently of the ITF. I'm happy to put it into an internet draft to put the useful and explicit description of what I call the cryptographic envelope, which is the series of contiguous cryptographic layers of MIME uh, that have no non-cryptographic layers in between them versus the cryptographic payload of a message. And the it is actually fairly straightforward to specify where the headers come from if you are willing to uh, to force your MIME perception into this view that there is a cryptographic exterior envelope and a cryptographic, and, and then there's the payload. And yes, somewhere in the payload, you might find some other crypto layers, and they are not going to affect the external headers of the message. If you adopt this, this conception, the simplification of MIME, and you force, you, your, you force your mail user to work that way, then you, it's actually fairly easy to identify the location where you expect the protected headers to reside. So there are so sort of separate two related issues and you're sort of talking about the second one which is also nice to fix but yes. i just trying to say that there are two you know related but two separate issues yes but I, but if you if you don't conceive of a cryptographic envelope if you if you don't have that conception then it becomes very difficult to identify where the protected headers should specifically exist okay. because you could have when you have a triple wrapped message right now we're talking about potentially having headers that are pushed from the outside into layer one, yep. outside into layer two, or outside into layer three, and potentially in all three places. And you now get to decide which message you expose to the outside, and you get to decide how you expose to the user what cryptographic protections were associated with the particular header that you're looking at on a per header basis, which is a nightmare. Yeah, that's bad. Could you send to the list a pointer to the document that's already written, just to save us we can explore the idea, and you don't have to uh, write a draft. That uh, DKG will hate me for this, but <laughs> um, another option on how to fix this is to define a new content type. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Which solves the message because it takes it out of the mime world. Mm. Okay. So we define a new content type which says, I'm a mind message and I have protected headers. Yep. On new TMS, CMS type. CMS content type. CMS content type. You can also do a new mime type, actually. Yeah. That would provide the same. But sorry, I'm, I'm just creating more, more alternatives. That's probably not very helpful. <laughs> do, do we care about this rendering on old clients? If we do, a novel, a novel MIME type or a novel CMS type is not going, not going to, to work. Help. Right. That's a very good point. I've made that argument in the past. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so I think the question that we're faced with in the last uh, one minute of the session <laughs> is, is this something the working group would like to talk to the ABs about adding to the charter? Would like included in charter? Do not want included in the charter. Those are two things we're going to hum on. Okay? Want to add it to the charter? Hum now. Want to put Alexi off again? Hum now. <laughs> Would you really like to hurt me? Okay. Thanks for all your attention. Safe journeys home. After TLS, of course. <laughs> Yeah.
Yeah, but I told him we were with that. But I think it worked out. It, it was worked out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what? Blue sheets. Could you bring them up? We should uh, maybe have some sort of technical discussion in a couple of weeks. If you have, if you have 